As we discussed in our last uh, lecture, archaeology is a subfield of cultural anthropology. Archaeology, as we talked about in our last class, is the branch of cultural anthropology that studies the uh, material remains in order to describe, explain human behavior. Archaeologists can only look at traces of human activities and infer from those traces the what, why, when, and how. There are some disadvantages to archaeology. Uh, partly, human behavior is limited partly by the preservation of past material culture. Uh, we know that there's poor preservation, and not all human behavior is recorded. Um, what happens is this leads to an incomplete picture of past culture. Um, but what archaeology does provide, it can document change over long periods of time, it can identify broad trends, and, and can sometimes explain transitions such as the change from hunting and gathering to agricultural ways of life. So in this lecture, I'm going to briefly talk about a cultural group, uh, the group that I study, the Maya, and look at an archaeological question that we were able to solve based on one excavation that we held uh, in 2008. Some of you might be familiar with uh, the Maya culture. Maybe some of you have gone to Cancun for your spring break and gone and visited Chichen Itza or Tulum. Uh, maybe some of you have seen some of the more popular uh, films out there that depict what the so-called Maya society and Maya life here being one of the more famous uh, clips from a movie, Apocalypto, where there are fantastic scenes of ritual sacrifice and of course, uh, picture, uh, scenes of warfare and uh, Maya running through the rainforest being chased by jaguars. But in reality, um, this is what constitutes the Maya realm. The Maya were never a unified empire like the Aztecs. Um, but this area on this map here, it shows you pretty much the definition and regional areas that the Maya occupied. This yellow area here is the Olmec heartland that had some influence in the cultural trajectory of the early Maya. Um, we know that the Maya realm constitutes the Mexican states of Tabasco, uh, Chiapas, Campeche, Quintana Roo, and the Yucatan Peninsula, now uh, the Yucatan state, uh, the countries of Belize, Guatemala, portions of El Salvador and Honduras. It is uh, some archaeologists that work in Mesoamerica um, also say that the influence of the Maya realm it goes as far as Nicaragua and Costa Rica to the south and up into central Mexico through these economic and trading uh, networks that were established with other uh, cultural groups. Uh, this is just giving you an example of the different important cities that we'll be discussing in this uh, class. One of those being Tikal, which is found in the central lowlands in an area known as the Paten in Guatemala. I work uh, 40 kilometers to the east of Tikal. I also do work here in northern Belize at a site called San Esteban. Uh, we won't be discussing San Esteban in this class, but mostly the work that's been done in the Homo region. Other important uh, Maya cities included Chichen Itza, which was an important capital of the Maya in the Yucatan during the post-classic, as well as the Mayapan, Mayapan being the last uh, Maya city before uh, the arrival of the Spanish. Uh, coincidentally, Mayapan uh, is abandoned 50 years prior to the Spanish arrival. Other important cities include Copan and Quiragua in uh, Honduras and, and southern Guatemala. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit about uh, Yashitlan and Bonapac. Uh, we'll mention El Mirador, which is the largest uh, Maya city built in the pre-classic period. And uh, there'll be some other important Maya cities uh, mentioned in this lecture. This is another map of the uh, geographic and topographic and political um, countries that make up the Maya realm. Again, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, and portions of Mexico in, were included in the Maya realm. Important mountain chains here include the Maya Mountains, which is in southern Belize, 
These are the Guatemalan highlands here where volcanic uh, material such as obsidian is found. Uh, the Rio Matagua River right here where jade is located. Uh, this area up here in northern Guatemala is known as the Batén. This is the tropical rainforest area where cities are built on large limestone karsts. Uh, we have material from the Caribbean Ocean that was exchanged and traded with other material found in the interior. And we have uh, trade networks that are found on the Pacific side. And we have trade networks that extend along the Caribbean coast up into the Gulf of Mexico. The Yucatan Peninsula, the northern Yucatan Peninsula, was an area that produced salt. Moving on. Here is a map, and this arrow here is pointing to the area which I do my research in. This is the Homo region. I'll take a, have another map here, a close-up map. But in this map, you can notice that we are about two, well, we're two hours into the uh, rainforest from the border of Belize here. And we're 40 kilometers from the important site of Tikal. This is a view of the area in which I work in. This is um, a picture that I, take, I took uh, standing on top of the largest structure at Ohomul, looking across the Homo region and focusing on a small hill over here, which is actually a monumental center named Sival. This gives you the idea of the landscape in which we work in uh, every day when we're out working in the Homo region. Um, what else can I say about this area? This is a famous, I'm, I'm jumping topic here, uh, from going to Home Wool and going into scenes of uh, palace life. This is a, an important mural found at Bonapak. And from this you can see, I, I think I know where I was going with this, uh, this slide here. Some of the costumes and some of the ornamentations of the Maya uh, kings in this procession here is important to note. As you can see, that some of the costumes are made up of jaguar pelts, quetzal feathers. Um, we have stone um, objects hafted onto spears, probably uh, projectile points of steer, spear tips. Here we have captives who uh, have their fingernails removed, and we see um, blood flowing from their hands. Here we have it uh, looks like crocodile heads and jaguar heads as part of these headdresses that these other kings are wearing. And the central figure here being this image on the wall is probably the, is the ruler of Bonapak. But what we're focusing on here is that in the rainforest, some of the material in which these uh, king, what some of the material that compose the outfits that these kings are wearing are found in our rainforest. So let's go back to the living conditions in the rainforest. Uh, living conditions, we spend three months out of the year living in the rainforest uh, in the Homo region. Here are some of the things that we encounter while living out in the jungle. We live in tents. We have a, a lab. We have permanent structures that are set out in the lab. There are um, huts and a kitchen and a storage uh, supply uh, buildings but mostly we live in tents for three months out of the year. We uh, drink local rainwater and um, we bathe in uh, water that we collect from the iguatas, which are these pockets of water. Uh, after, uh, after the river, the Homo River dries up, uh, they leave pockets of uh, water that we utilize. Some of the interesting life that we encounter out there include these pesky Little fellows, which are bot flies. Um, this is a photograph of a bot fly. And a bot fly will wrestle with a mosquito. As a mosquito bites you, the um, larva of the bot fly falls off, crawls into the hole, chews you from the inside out, and then eventually gets to the side, well, it gets to a big plump size where it turns back into a fly and flies out of your wound. Much of uh, my other responsibilities besides uh, directing the archaeological operations at Hamatoon is picking these things out of the backs of our workmen. So again, they're not, uh, the living conditions out there can be quite brutal at times. Um, here's a slide of my workmen. Again, 
Uh, we're working in the middle of the rainforest. Uh, the canopy does provide us quite a bit of shade, but we work from about six in the morning to about two in the afternoon because anytime after two o'clock, the heat is too oppressive to work in. Here's a slide of my workmen who are enjoying their 15 minute to half an hour uh, lunch break, taking a snooze in their backfield pile. All right, here is one of those aguadas that I had mentioned. Uh, these are two of my workmen standing in the middle of what will be the Homo River during the rainy season. Here though, you can see that there's pockets of water that stay, uh, that are collected when, during the dry season, when the, the river dries up. These can still be utilized uh, by the Maya today and probably would have supplied uh, a portion of the water supply to the Maya who lived there during the classic and pre-classic periods. We had mentioned and we had talked about Tikal. Uh, I haven't given you a lot of background on the Maya other than showing you some of the area in which I work. This is one important Maya city. This is Tikal. Here we have Temple One. And in this picture here, in this picture here, we have an overview of the center of the Maya city of Tikal. Here we have Temple One, Temple Two, important religious structures. We have the palace of Tikal here where the uh, king and the elite uh, court resided. We have the ball court, one of the most important ball courts located next to uh, Temple One. So we have entertainment, we have a re religious and political component. We may have this open plaza here may have been an administrative center or a marketplace. So we have political, social, economic functions all in this area. So much of Maya cities are not unlike some of our modern day cities. If you think of uh, in cities in our New England area, and again, most of you I assume are from uh, the New England area, and you look at your downtown, we have economic, social, political, and administrative buildings and religious buildings all in the same area. So when we look at a Maya city, we see all those different components that make up culture, right? Religious, um, political, economic, social. Uh, same is true here at Tikal, and I'm sure you've all have seen Tikal in some form uh, before. One of them, uh, one of the most famous shots is this shot here standing on Temple uh, 5 or 6 and looking out at the landscape of the area. If you could imagine when Tikal was a city uh, dating back to 500 AD to 600 AD, this whole area wouldn't have looked like this. It wouldn't have had canopy and, and rainforest. It would have been farmland and underneath this heart of the city here would have been a sprawling city that probably had a population of about 120,000. But this shot you've probably seen before because it is the Star Wars shot, it's uh, from Star Wars, the Rebel Base shot um, from George Lucas's movie Star Wars. All right, so some of you have seen Tikal before. This is a National Geographic um, illustration of what El Mirador, uh, important pre-classic site, may have looked like. Uh, this is an artistic reconstruction of the buildings we have red stuccoed facades and some of the important uh, religious and administrative and elite structures. Um, we have water resources. We have open plazas for people to congregate and meet. But again, this gives you an idea of what cities may have looked like in the pre-classic period and maybe even in the classic period. Here, again, as we go back to uh, modern interpretations of cities using video and film. Here is the uh, scene from Apocalypto um, depicting Richard Hansen and um, Mel Gibson's interpretation of what a Maya city would have looked like. Um, again, um, take it at face value. Uh, again, these are interpretations and, uh, and used for entertainment purposes. Like other civilizations, the Maya had important arch architectural achievements. Um, here is not a Maya architectural achievement, but a Roman. This is a Roman aqueduct. Uh, the Maya were incredibly gifted in, um, in geometry 
and, and, and building by the classic period. And at one site, Palenque, we see the building of aqueducts as well. Unlike Roman aqueducts, which were built off the ground, here is an aqueduct built into the ground where water is being funneled into the city, into the city center. This is the palace, the Palenque. Right next to the palace is this aqueduct, which is bringing fresh water into the city. So having necessary resources being brought to you was an important feature in Maya civilizations. Um, talking about uh, Maya achievements, if we look at this building here, uh, which is found at Palenque. And in your reading, um, your book discusses the sarcophagus and tomb of an important Palenque ruler, one of the, the longest lasting rulers of Palenque, Hanab Bakal. Inside this tomb, sorry, inside the structure of archaeologists, here's another uh, artistic reconstruction of this temple and the temples uh, adj adjacent. Inside this Structure archaeologists found the tomb of Bacall. Uh, his sarcophagus lid was made out of limestone, and on top of in that limestone was described the image of Bacall um, rising from death into the after into uh, the upper world uh, through the Axis Mundi tree here, which is a part of this image. Associated with his burial uh, was a number of jade ornamentation. Here's a jade ceremonial mask, uh, a jade necklace, jade uh, wrist uh, bands. Also uh, located in his two hands were a jade circle and a jade square. These two objects are important and they t t say much um, about the achievements of the Maya. A circle and a square are geometric uh, figures that are important for determining angles. So some of the architectural uh, layouts of Maya cities were aligned to note important celestial movements, the tracking Venus, tracking um, eclipses, tracking uh, the movement of uh, the sun during equinoxes. Uh, here, the appearance of a jade circle and a jade square in his hands showed how important geometry was and how geometry was used as, a, as was, was knowledge that was used and utilized by the Maya elite. All right, we had to cut that lecture in half because we ran out of space on the video camera, so I had a wardrobe change. So we'll figure out where we left off here. Here, um, this vessel here is the incense burner that I met, may have mentioned earlier. And when I was doing final uh, profu, prof, profile and plan views of the Sholtum, when I was scraping the bottom of the floor with my trowel, a little black, what appeared to be a little carved black rock came flying up at me. When I realized that there was a loose rock and Ruth, the loose rock we had found in this uh, crevice here, that's man made crevice, this incense burner. Here is a our artist's reconstruction of the uh, front facade of that um, incense burner. Uh, when we took off the lid, you could smell the copal, and it was uh, caked with a tarry residue. Um, so we knew this was an, uh, that it was copal and an incense burner. Uh, some interesting features of this ceramic vessel include this uh, trilobe headpiece, which is commonly referred to as the jester god. Right? Here's that trilobe piece here. And as you can notice, that there's two, looks like two hands holding a bar. We'll talk about that bar here in a second, but let me focus on this trilobe piece here that is referred to as the gesture god uh, headdress motif. That motif appears in other pre-classic important, uh, um, important artifacts and, uh, and, and structures and features. At Tikal Burial 85, the jade mask that was found in Burial uh, 85 also contains that trilobe piece here. The uh, masks at Seros, um, <clears throat> in one of the masks here, we see that trilobe piece. In the uh, at a jade pectoral found at Dumbarton Oaks, we also see that in the headdress of this uh, ruler here, a trilobe piece here, this trilobe here. And more importantly, at the San Bartolo murals that date to the pre-classic period, 
again, in this mask here, we see the trilobe. Let me maybe show you a close-up of that mural. Here's the west wall of the San Bartolo mural. In this mural, you can see a ruler sitting on a wooden throne, this little lattice throne here. Here you have another uh, elite member, possibly of another city or of um, the same city, but of an important position, passing over this jade mask to this uh, ruler here. On that mask is this tribal piece in his arms, in his hands is this bar, this symbol of power. So in this scene, we have the pre presentations of the mask of power. Probably in this scene, this figure here is being en enthroned as the new ruler of San Bartolo. So we know that this motif, this image, is important in pre-classic and later in classic uh, period artwork and denotes some sort of station or position in the Maya world. Here again is our vessel in regards to all the other objects and artifacts that we've discussed and features here. So we know that the co-vessel has this important image, um, this tribal piece. Uh, looking back, that we see that the trilobe is often found in headdresses. Here, in the Dunbarton Oaks piece, we have the trilobe with a headband and a headdress associated with Jade Ear Schools here again is the trilobe found in the jade mask that's being presented to the ruler at San Bartolo. Here again we have an ear spool. In our mask, not only do we have, and sorry, in our image, on the ceramic vessels, not only do we have the bar and the trilobe piece, but we also have jade ear flares and a mask um, ornamentation found on the front of this figure. So we know that maybe this ceramic vessel is depicting uh, an object, a person, you know, wearing a full mask regalia outfit. Again, going back to our piece here, now we have the trilobe piece, which is an important uh, image in Maya art and iconography depicting uh, elite status. But also let's focus in on this face here. This face here is an important, uh, unusual um, feature. Here in our, here is a photograph of our vessel here. If you focus in on this bar that goes around the face and this chin left here, and look at the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, it kind of sim looks similar to this Maya hieroglyphic um, text, which is the text for Ahau, or Divine Lord. So if you look at a comparison of a vessel that dates, predates Maya hieroglyphic writing, this again, based on our uh, radiocarbon date, dates our uh, skeletal remains to about 250 BC, um, this image here is maybe what will later become the image, the glyph for Divine Lord in the Classic period. So when we look at this uh, important ceramic vessel with the travel piece, the jade ear spools, the uh, possible headdress, the facial features that look similar to what will later become the glyph for Divine Lord, we see, indicate that this person that was buried in the Shultum burial may have been one of the earliest rulers or chiefs of Ko. So again, going back to how important our discovery was in the Shultum, not only did we find a 40 to 50 year old individual who may have been killed by a uh, strong blow to the head, uh, we know that the, bear, the dead don't bury themselves, so this person was entered into the ground in a man-made shultoon whose purposes uh, may have been for storage, water containment, when, then, when this feature was no longer um, uh, sustainable for that kind of uh, function. It served as a burial chamber for this individual. Um, the body was laid out uh, with the ceremonial vessels in a uh, form of a con cross, and we've talked about the importance of the con cross to the Maya. Um, we know that we can, re, uh, based on phytolithic analysis of one of the vessels, we can reconstruct the, the offerings, the biological offerings that were presented. Uh, we can uh, understand a little bit about the subsistence about the Maya during the pre-classic period. Um, we can say a lot about uh, their religious beliefs, we could say a lot about their political um, and social uh, life just based on some of the materials that we found. So again, as we reconstruct um, and understand the Maya at a very early period when the Maya are, are transitioning from uh, village life to city life, 
and we see a change in the social structure, this uh, burial is important for our early understandings of how the Maya became um, urbanized. So again, looking back in the vessels, here we have a collection, the, the collection very um, unique, very important. We don't, in, in the Homo region, we never, and up until this burial, found uh, an entire intact uh, burial. This vessel here is actually on tour. This is 2013. This vessel right now is on a, a tour called uh, Heavenly Jade, which is traveling from Guatemala, the, uh, the Museum of Guatemala, to Washington, D.C., to New York and China. And it's illustrating some of the my early Maya life and art and iconography. So this vessel right now is on a tour. I wish they were all traveling together um, with the jade pieces, the uh, biological remains, and the uh, skeletal remains. It's, um, it's an important find, an important discovery, and it tells us a lot about who the Maya were and, and some of their earliest religious, political, and social structures. And again, not that I want to compare myself to any kind of science fiction, but here I am standing, or sitting, sorry, on a pre-classic stairway that we found at Hammond Tomb. Um, really interesting find, um, but that's for another time and another place. All right, so thank you. This was our lecture on archaeology. We'll be moving on then to our next topic, which will be biological anthropology and physical uh, anthropology, and it'll be an abbreviated. So for the archaeology section, this lecture and a um, article, on, uh, a article on uh, the Garbage Project and William Rathje's work and will accompany this week's topic, which is archaeology. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture.